Rare is the occasion that can match the sheer quantity of imagery and symbolism surrounding Christmas. Even rarer the one that can match the commercialism, frankly. You have Christmas trees, Santa Claus, gingerbread houses, candy canes, and that's without even getting into religious images or generic winter symbols like snowmen, which invariably get wrapped up in the Yuletide jamboree. Then you have the poinsettia, the Christmas tree's classier cousin. While trees might come off depending on the context as gaudy or homely or even even juvenile, poinsettias are, like, universally tasteful. The kind of thing that can go up in an office. But don't take my word for it, the fact that tens of millions of these things get sold every autumn should speak for itself. It's not hard to imagine why this little shrub would manage to secure such a hold on the season, despite being notoriously difficult to keep alive. Its leaves turn red right before Christmas, for God's sake. It's practically begging to sit next to the mistletoe. And those are leaves, for the record. The flower is the tiny bit in the middle. The red has also been connotated with the blood of Christ, whoever that is. Poinsettias are probably not in the first five images you associate with Christmas, but they are ubiquitous. They're at your grocery store, they're at your workplace, they're in the shopping mall. There might even be one in the room with you right now. Oh my god. So why am I on this? A few weeks ago, I ate at a restaurant stuffed with Christmas decor to such an extent that customers kept saying Merry Christmas to the staff on their way out in November. Poinsettias were a particular centerpiece in that restaurant and something popped into my head suddenly. A memory of a story that I read years ago while researching for a project on the history of plants in mythology and folklore. I recalled a legend of a little girl witnessing the miracle that created the first poinsettia or something to that effect. So I went where anyone would. Wikipedia. And sure enough, Wikipedia does recount this legend. It's a Mexican legend apparently dating to the 1500s telling of a poor girl named Pepita or Maria who can't afford an offering on Christmas Eve, so an angel tells her to gather weeds which then miraculously transform into beautiful poinsettias and everyone lives happily ever after. But there's a line in the following paragraph that caught me off guard, and I was subsequently sent down a chain of rabbit holes. Well, there's rabbit holes, and then there's this. It turns out there's a lot more to this innocuous little horticultural stimulus check than I ever thought possible. To provide a little context, here's a brief history of the poinsettia. The poinsettia, scientific name Euphorbia pulcherima, is indigenous to what is now Mexico and Guatemala. In Nahuatl, it's called Cuetlaxochitl. It was cultivated by the Aztecs, who used it to produce both dye and medicine. After the Spanish conquest of Mexico, Franciscan monks monks also began cultivating it ornamentally, apparently for use as Christmas decor. In Mexico, it eventually took on the name Flor de Noche Buena, or Christmas Eve Flower. Joel Roberts Poinsett, an American diplomat and slave owner who served as ambassador to Mexico in the 1820s, stumbled on the plant, fell in love with it, and brought it back to the United States, where it was a rapid hit. It eventually made its way to Europe, where it was given its scientific name. In English, it was initially known as Painted Leaf, or Mexican Flame Flower, until after some time, author William Hickling Prescott assigned it the formal name Poinsettia in Poinsett's honor. Its modern Christmas time popularity erupted over the 20th century, with the plants even finding their way into the White House, and in 1986 it was reported to be the best-selling potted plant in the United States, despite only being on shelves for a sixth of the year. Poinsettia Day is observed in the United States on December 12th, the death date of Joel Poinsett. So now... We need to take a closer look at this history. Let's take it from the top. One of the first things I wanted to learn more about was the pre-colonial history of the poinsettia, and there are pathetically few resources on the subject. As mentioned earlier, it was cultivated in the Aztec Empire to produce both red dye and medicine from roughly the 1300s through 1500s. Sources differ on the exact nature of the medicine, although it's generally something gynecological and or a fever treatment. Multiple sources also attest that the plant was associated with Xochiquetzal, the Aztec fertility goddess, and it is frequently claimed that King Montezuma was a big fan and had several shrubs imported to Tenochtitlan every year for a winter festival. I can't find any further details on this festival. There is a festival for each of the 18 months of the Aztec calendar, and it's well documented that flowers were long used as decorations in these festivals, but there is no record of poinsettias appearing in any of them. In fact, one of the earliest colonial records indicates that there was a superstition of the plant being bad luck. I mentioned earlier 
earlier that the Nahuatl word for the plant is Quetlaxochitl. Something that rapidly became apparent is that there is no consensus on the etymology of Quetlaxochitl. It should be uncontroversial to say that Xochitl translates to flower. I mean, it's a given name. Wikipedia translates Quetlaxochitl as flower that grows in residues or soil. Uh, incidentally, the word root of this interpretation appears to be less residues and soil and more shit. Incidentally, on December 14th, after I wrote that portion of the script, uh, the Wikipedia page was updated to reflect this. But the really interesting part is Wikipedia's own source for this claim, a website run by the University of Illinois, doesn't actually call it flower that grows in residues or soil. It translates it as mortal flower that perishes and withers like all that is pure. This is more in line with Wiktionary's proposed etymology, which interprets the first half of the word as withering. No source for the record, but the blossoming of flower that withers into mortal flower withering like all that is pure is a bit of flowery prose that has made its way into several articles. The earliest source I have on that is an essay from the 1992 collection Drink Cultura by Jose Antonio Berciaga. We'll be coming back to this essay later, I promise you. The transformation of a compound word in an indigenous language that may or may not mean flower that withers in reference to a plant that quite famously dies when you look away from it for two seconds into a lengthy fake deep adage. I'm kind of surprised that I haven't seen anybody point out that that's like a little bit offensive. <laughs> Mark Hoddle, an entomologist who wrote about poinsettias, translates it as brilliant flower. Uh, I have no clue why. Another source calls it flower that grows with leather petals, probably deriving from Quetlachtli or skin. And yet another one calls it star flower. As far as I can tell, there's no agreement. But the interpretation about feces is the one that's put forth by the online Nawaz dictionary. One of its two entries for different spellings of Quetlachtli reads, the name probably refers to the growth of the plant on dung heaps. There's also disagreement on the significance of the color in Aztec culture, if indeed there was one. Some sources claim that red signifies purity, while several others associate it with blood, either blood sacrifices or the spilled blood of fallen warriors. This is the tip of the iceberg. Let's jump into the water. <laughs> Remember how I mentioned the page that Wikipedia cited, the one run by the University of Illinois? Well, the same page states that a botanist named Juan Balm noted the poinsettia in his writing. This claim is echoed in several other sources, often with added details about Balm being a famed or noted botanist or writing of the poinsettia several times. As a matter of fact, when you search Juan Balm, all you get is articles about poinsettias. It's almost as if the only time his name is ever used period is when another piece on the history of poinsettias goes up, which does trip an alarm bell in my head, I gotta say. If he's such a famous and noteworthy botanist, why is nobody putting forward any other information on him in any other context? If he kept bringing up this plant in his writings, why does nobody say what these writings are? <laughs> Granted, I could just be looking in the wrong place. So I dug deeper, and the earliest statement of this fact that I could find online was a 2002 academic paper, The History and Diseases of Poinsettia, the Christmas Flower. And they have almost a whole paragraph on Juan Balm, including his description of the plant with an actual citation. The source cited is a virtual exhibit at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum dated 2001 and titled The Legends of Christmas. And they link to it, but I can't fucking click the link. Okay, no big deal, right? It's a virtual exhibit. I should just be able to go to the museum website and find it from there. <laughs> no. They have a few virtual exhibits, including a Christmas one, but not the Legends of Christmas. Clearly, the webpage in question is no longer. It appears to have correlated with an actual temporary museum exhibit in something called the real world, still looking into that, and they have video records of several of those, so I scoured the Hoover Museum's YouTube channel and found everything but the Legends of Christmas. You ever want to know about Hollywood cowboys, Hoover's got you covered? I heard a rumor there's a door prize for the 200th viewer. So I had to start thinking outside the box, and outside the box here means finding another source that cites the same webpage. So I found a Begzer County Extension article on the history of Christmas trees, a subject which I take no interest in whatsoever and would never make a video about. It cites the Hoover Museum with a link, 
It's a dead link, obviously, but link means URL, means Wayback Machine, means Jesus, this is ugly. So here it is, the Hoover Museum Legends of Christmas Poinsettia subsection. And guess what? No mention of Juan Balm whatsoever. But hey, it has our favorite legend, and, and it's a boy instead of a girl. And his name is Young Mario. It seems like the citation in the history and diseases of Poinsettia was only for the last sentence of that paragraph. I guess all the preceding facts on the page came from a tarot reading. Granted, the rest of the article is mostly about actual pathologies, and it appears to be rigorously researched, or so its 71 citations would suggest, but I can't wrap my head around writing an academic paper and citing a website that looks like this. The Hoover page doesn't even cite its sources. So at this point, I think I've adequately demonstrated that something is at the very least suspect about the claim that this 400-year-old botanist was writing about poinsettias. This time frame puts him at the earliest days of modern botany, too. We're talking a hundred years before Linnaeus, two hundred before Darwin. This still leaves us at an impasse. Is there even a Juan Balm? Well, remember how I said all the search results were about poinsettias? There was one that wasn't, but I initially wrote it off as a coincidence. But then I decided to look closer. Wikipedia has a list of plant genera named for people, and one name on this list is Juan Balm Giraud, born 1880, died 1964. There's no way it's the same guy who wrote about the poinsettia in the 17th century, but the fact that it is botany we're talking about was enough to raise an eyebrow, and my consternation eventually peaked enough for me to take a look at the source. Burkhart's index of eponymic plant names lists Juan Balm Giraud, born Jean-Pierre Balm, and describes him as a French born Mexican professor of horticulture and national park overseer, Juan Balm Giraud wrote a handful of articles under the name Juan Balm in the early 1900s that were printed in various journals, including the Bulletin of the Botanical Society of Mexico. Most of his papers are in Spanish, one in French. His clear focus was orchids, but he also wrote about a few fruits. Notably, nowhere in his surviving bibliography is there any mention of the poinsettia. But hold on, Indigo, I hear you asking. Didn't you say that there's a plant genus named after him? Well, in 1942, volume 69 of the Bulletin of the Tory Botanical Club printed an article by Mexican botanist Maximino Martinez titled A New Genus of Rubiaceae. Martinez describes a shrub with the common name Ayuke and proposes the scientific name Balmea Storme for two namesakes, the species for author Marion Storm, who had frequently collaborated with Martinez, and the genus for, in Martinez's words, Professor Juan Balm, able student of ornamental plants. Incidentally, the Wikipedia page calls it Stormie. I don't know where the I came from. <laughs> now, what does this have to do with anything? Maybe nothing. Except, there's a 1974 article by F.R. Fosberg which posits Balmea storme as an endangered species. Why is it endangered? Because, according to Fosberg, Marion Storm had written to him claiming that the shrubs were being cut down and sold as Christmas trees. Take this with a grain of salt. I haven't been able to find a single photograph of the IUK being used this way or any other attestation of it. Supposedly this was because of a law prohibiting conifers from being cut down to use as Christmas trees, I again couldn't find another source for that, but I will confess on that count that hunting down a 60-year-old regional forestry regulation from a country I don't live in in a language I don't speak is not playing to my strengths. What we do know for certain, however, is that it was claimed in a published article in the 70s. So on one hand, we have questionable allegations of a Juan Balm from 400 years ago writing about a plant that came to be known as a major Christmas symbol, and on the other hand, we have a demonstrative real Juan Balm from the last century who was the namesake of a plant attested to have been used as a Christmas symbol. Keep in mind that we're talking about a guy with a Spanish first name and a French last name. That's not a name that you trip over. Like, we're not looking for Mr. Smith from London. This is speculation, please keep that in mind. But the thing rattling around in my head is like, is it at all possible that the 17th century Juan Balm is a transposition of the 20th century one? That somehow, this Mexican botanist is the namesake of a plant used as a Christmas decoration, transformed into this Mexican botanist wrote about a plant used as a Christmas decoration. Again, all speculation, huge grain of salt, but it's also the only way that I can make sense of this. The part I get tangled up in is the way that the History and Diseases paper attributes a description of the plant to Balm. Juan Balm, a botanist of the same period, mentioned the poinsettia plant in his writings. He described it as having large green leaves and a small flower surrounded by bracts, almost as if for protection. The 
Bracts, he said, turned a brilliant red. Balm also found the plant flourishing on the slopes and in the valleys near Cuernavaca. But before I can even gather my bearings, another fighter comes in swinging. Coranderismo.org is a website about Coranderismo, which is an umbrella of traditional medicines practiced in various parts of Latin America. And this site has a recounting of the poinsettia's history with an alleged quote from Juan Balm from the 17th century. The flower is tiny like the bougainvillea, but is surrounded by bracts that appear to shield or shields to protect it, with big green leaves turning red are to those of blood. So it's probably a questionable translation. But I can do better than that. So Juan Balm wrote this in the 1600s. I'm impressed that he managed to mention the Bougainvillea decades before the birth of its namesake. Nothing was published about the Bougainvillea till 1789. This supposed guy in the 1600s was not name dropping it. I have no clue where this passage comes from. When I search chunks of it in quotation marks, all I get is this article and people quoting it. The only thing that gives me pause is that it has an undeniable undeniable resemblance to the description attributed to Balm in the History and Diseases paper, but this paper, The Discovery, Naming, and Typification of Euphorbia Pulcherima by Walter Lack, is one of the most key resources we can refer to. It's an exhaustive account of the history of the poinsettia's identification and notable early writings about it. Absolutely no mention of a Juan Balm, nor are any of the enclosed quotations even remotely similar to this one, nor is any comparison made to the Bougainville. The enigmatic description leaves me unwilling to call this a 100% closed case, but 99% for sure. I'm satisfied in saying that I don't believe there was a Juan Balm in the 1600s writing about poinsettias. The crazy part is that as far as I can tell, I seem to be the first person to call this into question. I haven't seen a single instance of anybody casting doubt on this frequently repeated claim about Juan Balm, at least not in any way that leaves a record online. And trust me, I have looked. Anyway, so we're about here on the iceberg. Let's move on. <laughs> The next tidbit holds that Franciscan monks who settled in Tasco cultivated poinsettias for centuries and used them as Christmas decorations. It's well documented that there were at least 12 monks in Mexico as early as the 1520s, but once again, there is absolutely no source that they were growing poinsettias, outside the circle jerk of did you know slop that miscellaneous papers and websites are squeezing out every December. Some sources, and this is my favorite part, some sources claim that the monks specifically used the flowers for an event called the Fiesta of Santa Pesebre. One must assume that the English of was not their preposition of choice. Do I even need to tell you that when I try to look up Santa Pesebre, all I get is the same set of poinsettia trivia articles? You'd think there'd be other customs associated with this festival. There's not a single resource online that credibly testifies to this being an actual name used anywhere by anyone. What is this supposed festival even devoted to anyway. Hang on a sec. Who the fuck is Saint Nativity Scene? I'm sure some wise guy's already saying, um, don't you know Santa can also just mean holy? And I would fire back by pointing out that Pesebre is a masculine noun anyway. That should be an O. <laughs> Crazier still, some articles purport that Hernando Ruiz de Alarcón observed the Franciscan monks using the flowers in this alleged festival. Guess whether there's a credible source on that. Alarcón famously observed indigenous beliefs, customs, and practices with the intent of denouncing them as he than read. He wrote a long book about exactly that. Frankly, I'm not sure why he would consider the gardening rituals of Spanish monks in the area to be so worthy of no. And better yet, there are no Spanish language sources for the claim that monks were growing this plant. It should go without saying that an apparent piece of Mexican history that's exclusively documented in English is kind of suspect. <laughs> So Joel Roberts Poinsett was foreign ambassador from the United States to the newly seceded Mexico for a few years in the 1820s. And to be clear, he was not a good person. 
He owned slaves. Poinsett believed that Mexico would only survive as a republic if white Creoles stayed at the top of the social ladder. In fact, he tried to intervene in Mexican politics to further American interests, even going so far as to spur a pro-Yankee political party, making him extremely unpopular in Mexico, to the extent that he, after years of meddling, was called back to the US. Most resources on his relationship with the plant don't have anything to say about his actual career, those that do are generally generally rose-tinted about it. Several sources describe him as well-educated and charismatic, nothing to say about him being a slave owner and opponent of abolition. National Geographic calls Poinsett swashbuckling. A Utah Daily Herald article says Poinsett was very dutiful as an ambassador and congressman. And that phrasing is like, did you even look him up? Like, this is such a sentence you type when you know someone's occupation and nothing else. Granted, the paper in question has a decidedly conservative bent, so they could just as easily be fully informed. But the reason I'm singling out this article is that it also includes a personal anecdote whose last sentence is crazy. Even setting aside the alarming apostrophe, do not the bees feast on the sweet sticky substance? <laughs> If this was meant to be poetic, it kind of missed the mark. Sentences that a fucking gnome would say. One strange factoid about Poinsett that gets tossed around a lot is that botany was his real passion, some even going so far as to call him a botanist. It is well documented that he had an interest in plants. That doesn't equate to that being his whole personality. <laughs> it's really funny that his priorities in life would happen to align with exactly what his name would come to represent. It's almost as if he knew that he'd be more remembered as the namesake of a flower than for his actual career. Some sources have straight up said, you can tell he had a real interest in botany because he owned a plantation. So the story goes that Poinsett, during his time in Mexico, discovered the flower. I guess he could be said to have discovered it the same way that suburbanites discover Korean barbecue. Some sources say that he saw it at the roadside during a constitutional. Others claim that he witnessed it in a Franciscan nativity scene. I kind of feel like we can toss that one out. So one way or another, Poinsett found the plant and he immediately fell in love with it and sent clippings to his home in South Carolina from which it was somehow passed to the Bartram garden in Philadelphia, where it was shown off at a flower show, starting a whole sensation. And to quote another delicious article, The Poinsettia History and Transformation by Judith Taylor et al. Almost no evidence exists to support this charming and delightful story. According to this article, it really is documented that Poinsett sent miscellaneous seeds and clippings to his friends, and the name Joel Poinsett was tossed around after the arrival of our favorite shrub in Pennsylvania, but no evidence suggests that it was sent to South Carolina first, and we can't be certain that Poinsett was even the person who sent it. The Bartram Garden's own bulletin says it's unclear who the Poinsettia clippings came from. Poinsett wrote a whole ass book on his time in Mexico, and didn't see fit to mention this plant that he was so ensorcelled by. Taylor and friends also note Poinsett's 1935 biography by Fred Rippey, who could not find evidence that Poinsett had sent that specific flower. To Quote, Rippy dryly commented that it is generally acknowledged in the horticultural guides that Mr. Poinsett introduced the flower. There are several articles that speak more bluntly and less favorably about Poinsett's life and career, and a piece of trivia that recurs in many is that Poinsettismo became a term in Mexico for intrusive meddling. I've seen this claimed many times. It seems to trace back to a 1993 article in the Washington Post, The Secret Strife of Plants by Robert Fulgham. The Mexican coined the word poinsettismo to characterize his kind of intrusive behavior. The largest Spanish language dictionary in the world, which has 93,000 words, does not contain poinsettismo. The Spanish Wiktionary, which has almost 70,000 Spanish nouns, does not contain poinsettismo. I have found a minuscule selection of Spanish language sources which use the word poinsettismo in reference to poinsett's general way of doing things. Consider this excerpt from a 1992 article 
article by Mario Moya Potencia in which, in reference to US President James Monroe's political relationship with Poinsett, Potencia says figuratively that Poinsettism and Monroeism may as well have been the same thing. It's not exactly a secret that as a suffix, ismo is equivalent to the English ism. I think it's a bit misleading to construe an occasional figure of speech where a suffix is stuck onto a politician's name to describe the doctrine of that politician as a phrase coined by a country to describe a type of behavior. Before we move on, it's worth noting that there has been a push, a small push for clarity's sake, by no means a headlining phenomenon, but a push nonetheless to return to calling the plant Quetlaxochitl rather than Poinsettia because of, well, the namesake. To be clear, I support condemning Poinsett and I wouldn't object to the plant being renamed, but I think that the way that it's being argued for is flawed. There are three key sentiments in play in these arguments. The first is that Poinsett's character reflects negatively on the plant through association. A lot of think pieces frame it as like the dark secret of poinsettias, the dark past that you didn't know this plant was hiding. The idea that this plant has baggage irrevocably shoveled onto it by etymological association is frankly a bit mystical. The second sentiment is that Quetlaxochitl is the true or authentic name of the flower insofar as any discursive signifier for anything can be called true or authentic. I am automatically skeptical of any appeal to the ingrained authenticity of older modes of expression. In my experience, approaching the world through that lens tends to invite self-delusion when the actual oldest version of something isn't what you want it to be. And in general, arguing for why we should roll back to an idyllic past Come on now. The third sentiment is that Poinsett personally stole the plant from Native Americans. It's kind of self-defeating to argue that something in Mexico was only touched by colonialism and racism when an American chauvinist interacted with it, as if the three centuries of Spanish colonial rule prior to that were nothing. It seems to correlate with a worryingly common ahistorical attitude of Latin America as somehow not counting as colonized, of Spanish as not being a colonizer language. To see that in action, look no further than the English think pieces whose quote-unquote decolonized descriptor of the flower is La Quetla Xochitl. Like, are you serious? What are you implying when your signifier for the uncolonized version of this plant involves a Spanish definite article? More to the point though, building a case for a theft occurring at the cultural level requires demonstrating that the victims of that theft have been deprived of something. I don't object to the idea of the plant being re names to remove reference to Poinsett, you have to construct a stronger argument than saying it's because he's gross. You have to situate the word Poinsettia within the broader scope of naming choices that implicitly or explicitly honor the legacy of imperialism. And then you also have to contend with the question of, is Poinsettia even the hill to die on? Supposing that you somehow convinced every Anglophone to learn to pronounce Quetlaxochit, and you convinced retailers to drop the patriotic association of an American and historical figure, what then has actually been accomplished? The Aztecs are spoken about like a thing of the past, but there are Nahua people in Mexico today alongside dozens of other indigenous ethnic groups. What would the swapping of a term in the Anglosphere do for the benefit of the 11 million indigenous people in Mexico? It would only be a win on the ideological level. You don't actually need to face reality, face colonialism's causes or its legacy or anything that's actually wrong with the world. You can distill everything into an objection with a word or a phrase. And again, I'm saying all of this as somebody who doesn't object to the poinsettia being renamed. I am in favor of renaming things that are named after colonizers, and I have brought up the fact that Poinsett owned slaves at every chance I could because I refuse to let it be forgotten. But the push here isn't even really about renaming it. The push is that you should say Quetlaxochitl instead of poinsettia, as if to preserve your own morality. It's individualism, plain and simple and it comes out especially in the fact that the gripe seems to be less with the things Poinsett actually did, the imperialism, the slave owning, and more with the fact that he said something problematic. It frustrates me to see the type of person, the type of crowd, that correctly decries and disavows colonialism, racism, and all the other things that should be decried and disavowed, but is entirely unwilling to develop any cogent politic beyond that. One last remark on the subject, a much pettier one. Some of these infographics graphics present really questionable pronunciation guides for Quetlaxochi. I'm not going to pretend I'm getting it perfectly, like actual speakers enunciate it differently, and I can tell I'm making
making the tl sound really forced, but this isn't even trying. So as long as we're talking about names. So the plant ended up in Berlin by way of Scotland and landed in the hands of legendary botanist Carl Ludwig Wildenau. The scientific name Euphorbia pulcherima was first put into publication by Johann Kloch, who attributed it to Wildenau. Several sources claim that Wildenau saw a poinsettia growing out of a crack in his greenhouse and was swept by its beauty, which is why he gave it the species name pulcherima, meaning the most beautiful. At this point, will it surprise you? if I say that this story is completely unsubstantiated. I mean, it's not even a good lie. <laughs> yes, this famously fragile plant emerged from a crack. Why was it there? Did he trip and scatter seeds all over the place? Anyway, so it has an accepted scientific name, but the English name was inconsistent. Some were calling it painted leaf, others Mexican flame flower, others just Euphorbia pulcherima. To the end of naming it, William Hickling Prescott was approached. Prescott is considered one of the greatest American historians of all time. He wrote The Conquest of Mexico, which is why he was the perfect candidate for naming this Mexican flower. The name he assigned it was, of course, Poinsettia, in honor of Joel Poinsett. Would you believe that this too is bullshit? <laughs> Once again, at the most surface level, why would the community collectively turn to a historian and ask him to name this flower? Why would everyone say, okay, let's collectively vest that authority in fucking mutton chops here and call this flower whatever he says we should call it forever. It gets better though, as is pointed out by Taylor and company. Prescott wrote The Conquest of Mexico in 1843, and because of that, he was asked to name this flower, which had been called poinsettia as early as 1836. Come on now. The story isn't just flimsy, it's gossamer. And it's regurgitated everywhere, up to and including on that University of Illinois page. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if any of the commonly held cultural history of this plant has any basis in fact. At least the legend of the little girl admits that it's a legend, right? That story about Pepita or Maria or young Mario, the little girl or boy who miraculously received poinsettias to lay at the altar, the story whose recollection sent me into this this spiral to begin with. Surely that's not going to disappoint us. Several sources, including Wikipedia, claim that the legend itself dates to the 1500s, the very beginning of the Spanish colonization of the Americas. But I thought that the flower didn't have any associations with Christmas until the 1600s at the earliest, when the monks supposedly started growing it. Well, maybe what's meant is that the story is supposed to be set in 1500s Mexico, but actually dates from later. I wouldn't phrase it like this if that were the case, but what? Ever. The claim that the poinsettia has been a Christmas symbol in Mexico for centuries is tenuous at absolute best. I can't find a source for when the flower started to be called Noche Buena in Mexico, and God knows I've tried, but it's at least as far back as 1923. Christmas Everywhere, a book from 1931, claims that the Noche Bueno is seen in great profusion. Then it goes on to speak as if the poinsettia is a different plant? It's worth noting that Noche Buena is far far from the only Spanish name. In fact, it's not even the first name on the Spanish Wikipedia page. So the time frame is suspicious. So what? I'm sure the legend itself has been around for a long time. Well, it's kind of telling that the Spanish language Wikipedia page doesn't mention this Mexican legend at all. Even more telling is that there are very few Spanish resources on this legend, period. Not zero, mind you but few. Take this one, for instance. Sure, it's a clickbaity kids website with a Coco Melon aesthetic, but it is Spanish, as in from Spain and not Mexico. This is a 1995 storybook that tells a variant of the story in both English and Spanish, where the color change is provoked by the child's tears. The kid's name is Carlos, by the way. This book is by two American authors of Mexican descent. One of them was apparently a financier for Spy Kids, why not? There's another storybook from 1997 purported to be based on an old Mexican tale, also by an American author. The kid's name is Lucida now. There's a 1998 article in a Costa Rica 
Rican newspaper on the legend. Suspiciously no news sources from Mexico though. The closest it gets is the aforementioned essay from Drink Cultura, the one that originated the mortal flower that perishes claim, which was once again written by an American man of a Mexican background and has two versions of the legend. The one that we know and love, and a version where Franciscan monks witness the flower turn red at their nativity scene on Christmas Eve. It also includes the claim about Poinsett witnessing the flowers at a nativity scene. In fact, there are several easily disproven claims in the span of a few pages, such as Poinsett was an architect who built a bridge, totally unsubstantiated, conflated with the bridge named after him. He'd been appointed Secretary of War prior to being ambassador, even though this is clearly years after his tenure in Mexico. He was recalled to the United States on Christmas Day, just untrue. This might be my favorite, referring to the family euphoria or rather Euphobiaceae, as a species. And that leads me to call into question the veracity of any and all claims in this essay. I mean, it's not like there's citations anyway. One more thing, just because I want to roll. The same essay says, The Quetlaxochitl was cultivated as an exotic gift from nature. What? The flower was considered exotic by the people cultivating it in its indigenous region? The English resources on the legend of Pepita are universally older than the Spanish ones. Folklore professor Tristram Coffin's 1973 book of Christmas folklore, for example, tells a variant of the story about an unnamed boy who is presented with poinsettias after praying. No citations in the entire book. Even older than that, a 1965 article published in Elementary English, Windows on the World by Victoria Johnson, has a version of the story very close to the one we know with an unnamed girl picking plants. Older still, The Book of Festival Holidays by Marguerite Ickes from 1964 reports the legend with once again an unnamed girl. I wouldn't rule out the idea that Johnson got the story from Ickes' book. The second earliest mention of this fairy tale that I can turn up being a journal for elementary school English teachers in the US might give us a hint about the story's dissemination. This is purely conjectural, but the journal in question includes plenty of resources and advice for teaching and curriculum building. The prospect of a teacher reading this journal, learning a piece of information, and sharing it with their class, while again conjecture, is not impossible. This is total conjecture which should be taken with a boulder of salt, but I don't think it's out of the question that the story propagated like this, like a rumor, and that the inconsistencies arose downstream of that. If that were true, which I am not saying that it is because it's impossible to prove, it would mean that it's a double-layered legend. Not a Mexican legend about a miraculous flower, but an American legend about a Mexican legend about a miraculous flower. One more time for good measure, all speculation. To get back to the point, here's a 1927 paper by Max Wagner called Some Notes on the Folklore of Mexico. It recounts multiple Christmas legends and customs, no mention of the poinsettia story whatsoever. The fact that the story isn't there does not disprove any anything, but, well, who does the burden of proof fall to again? Scholarship on the subject of Mexican folklore isn't anything new, so why isn't there any on this supposed piece of folklore? The fact is though, even though hours and hours of searching have not turned up any account of this legend earlier than 1964, I can't write it off entirely. Ickes must have gotten the story from somewhere. Well, maybe she fabricated it, but I don't see a reason to claim that. <laughs> Likewise though, if we reach the point where we're saying, well, you can't really prove it's false, therefore we have to act as though it's true, we might as well all become Jehovah's Witnesses. I could claim that Harry Houdini ate rocks and nothing else. He fucking loved eating rocks and stones and dirt. And then I could just say, well, you can't prove it's not true. Would you then feel obligated to accept that? We're never gonna uncover a 300 year old document that says this legend never existed because that's not how proving things works. I think it's at the very least fair to say that the claim that this this legend originated in Mexico is a flimsy one, and that it's unlikely that it dates to any earlier than the 20th century. If nothing else, I can say with confidence that Pepita was not the original name of the character from the story, and she wasn't called that until the 90s.
So to illustrate just how crazy everything is, I want to go over the list of poinsettia facts one more time and mark off which ones are actually true. The poinsettia plant was cultivated by Aztecs and used as dye and medicine. True. Montezuma had the plant imported for a winter festival. Probably false. The Nahuatl word for poinsettia is Quetlaxochitl. True. Quetlaxochitl translates to mortal flower that perishes and withers like all that is pure. Flower that withers is potentially true, but the purple prose is baseless. The 16th century legend of Pepita is overstated at the very least. Juan Balm wrote about the plant in the 1600s. False. Franciscan monks cultivated it for nativity scenes. False. Fernando Ruiz observed these monks. False. Joel Poinsett was an ambassador to Mexico. True. Poinsett was and is unpopular in Mexico. Also true. Poinsettismo is a term in Mexico for intrusive behavior. False. Poinsett found the plant on a road or in a nativity scene. False. Poinsett sent the plant to South Carolina. False. Poinsett sent the plant to Pennsylvania. Possible but unprovable. Carl Ludwig Vildeneau assigned the scientific name. True. He did this after the plant grew through a crack in his greenhouse. False. William Prescott was approached to name the flower. False. So of the 17 facts composing the archetypal history of the poinsettia, five are unambiguously true. And this is a generous count, by the way, I could have easily listed some things like Santa Pesebre separately. That line about poinsettias growing out of shit is starting to seem pretty appropriate. The scope of these claims is crazy, by the way. I've alluded to it already, but there really are dozens of articles going over the same few points. Just how much of the pseudo-news ecosystem is paraphrases of the same articles being passed around ad nauseum. My first take on the matter was, are these falsehoods simply seen as acceptable because we're talking about Christmas? Is it that on some level, when we're talking about something already fantastical, already mythological, it's simply not necessary to be truthful? You know, in the same way that kids get told about Santa Claus, is it just okay to turn poinsettias into a matter of myth? Is this just what is to be expected from something that is already treated as, in essence, folklore? Like when saying that the legend of a girl with a bundle of flowers is 500 years old, is it just not necessary to say where you got that information, who made a record of it, and why we know about it 500 years later? Because it's a legend? You know, they're spreading legends, and then they're saying, well, because legends exist, nothing needs to be truthful. But if you've looked at the timestamp, I think you know that's not the conclusion. It's a little too neat and tidy for me, and that's for two reasons. One, the falsehoods seem to have been bottlenecked in the 90s and early 2000s. Surely the internet had some role to play in that, but there seems to be another pretty big factor. A book. Poinsettia's Myth and Legend by Christine Anderson and Terry Tischer, a kid-friendly book of poinsettia fun facts published in 1997. Most of our lies have passed through this book. Well, hey, at least the title's accurate. Let's see which claims appear. Montezuma imports Quetlaxochitl, which is misspelled by the way, to Tenochtitlan for a winter festival. A few variants of the Pepita legend. In fact, this is the earliest instance I can find of the character in this legend being called Pepita. Franciscan priests use the flowers in nativity scenes, Joel Poinsett, who is described as brilliant, sophisticated, erudite, adventurous, and magnetic, but shockingly not as chauvinistic, paternalistic, racist, or slave-owning, happens upon the flower at the roadside and falls in love with it. His career is covered, but largely glossed over. Better yet, the book implies that he actively braved dangers, put himself in harm's way as part of a pointed effort to discover plants, presumably so that they could be named after him, Vildenau, seriously misspelled, saw a point poinsettia growing through a crack in his greenhouse. And last but not least, William Prescott was approached to name the plan. Better yet, it claims that the conquest of Mexico described poinsett's discovery of the plan. Completely false. Full text is online. It also implies that that fact is a coincidence, unrelated to Prescott being asked to name the plan. The notion that Prescott's already tenuous and indirect relationship with the poinsettia was an accident adds so much implied lore to this false narrative? Like, was this nebulous coalition of horticulturists just going to William Prescott's house once a week and asking him to name assorted plants? Was he, like, the only legally ordained thing namer in the area? I need to stop thinking about this. The only thing they don't mention, barring any unkind words toward Poinsett, is Juan Balm. I must give a shout out to this review of this book, which pointed out some of the myths propagated by it, and it's the 
reason that I investigated it to begin with. This review comes from Hortistoria, the personal website of Judith Taylor? <laughs> Does Judith Taylor know that she's my hero? I have since learned that almost everything attributed to Poinsett and Prescott in this connection is a myth. Did you know? But I said that there were two reasons that the Christmas myth theory doesn't do it for me, and all of that was only one of them. The second reason is most of the lies point in the same direction. They serve the same end. What do I mean by that? Well, to claim Aztecs used the poinsettia for a winter festival is to attribute long-standing spiritual significance to the plant while also appealing to an exotified history. The legend of Pepita and the story about the Franciscan monks directly suggests that the people who display poinsettias today are participating in a sacred Christian tradition that dates back centuries. The insistence on associating the poinsettia with its namesake frames the plant as distinctly American and creates an illusion of historical significance. The extensive praise for poinsett, when combined with the twee stories of him witnessing the plant at a nativity scene or whatever, almost serves to intellectualize the aesthetic value of the poinsettia. There's a one-two punch of setting poinsett up to be this brilliant cultured superior man and then having him immediately recognize the beauty of this flower. It narrativizes the poinsettia's popularity as something deliberate, something orchestrated, something centuries in the making, while also recuperating poinsett's legacy and by extension the legacy of American international relations. It's a single stroke, poinsett becomes mythic to prop up the poinsettia, and the poinsettia becomes mythic to prop up poinsett. Poinsett becomes synonymous with the poinsettia and he's thereby transformed from an intrusive slave-owning diplomat who, despite an interest in plants, never considered this one to be worthy of particular mention, into a swashbuckling adventurer who heroically graced the world with a crucial Christmas symbol. Pursuant to this, adding South Carolina as a stop on the Poinsettia's world tour adds gravitas to a region with several landmarks named for Poinsett. The story about the flower growing through a crack in Vildeneau's greenhouse is a baffling piece of fairy tale nonsense that applies a sloppy veneer of whim to what would otherwise be a completely unremarkable biological christening. And the story of Prescott being asked to name the flower just squeezes another quote-unquote American hero into the narrative, while also mythologizing it even further, as if all the horticulturists in the world knew that this was a really special flower, and that its name could only be handed down from the top of the ivory tower. As if even after rumors had already alleged that it was Poinsett who quote-unquote discovered this plant, it would still take a real elite member of the intelligentsia to assign that plant Poinsett's name with a couple extra letters. As usual, Juan Balm is an outlier. There literally was a colonial physician who wrote about the Quetlaxochitl in the 1500s. I can't really grasp why that would need to be fabricated. Now, it might be tempting to say, well... Is anyone really harmed by these little white lies? And it's true that they're not harmful in and of themselves. Who can really say that they've been harmed by misinformation about Mr. Mutton Chops? But I don't think anyone would dispute that true histories are generally better than false or embellished ones. The spread of falsehoods weighs everybody down. Now even people who argue against Poinsett's legacy are still circulating the same myths. Even Judith Taylor et al. say that records have survived indicating the poinsettia's use in winter festivals, and the records in question are a fun fact book from the 90s. But most of these falsehoods, as I said, run together. They construct a narrative of the poinsettia as distinctly historical, distinctly Christian, distinctly American, and distinctly significant. Now that's a flower with a national holiday. The lies, the falsehoods, the myths, and the legends all point in one direction, and that direction is the most obvious thing thing it could possibly be. The poinsettias are an industry. As you can see, it's starting to look a lot like Christmas around here. You like the set? You like our poinsettias? We, uh, the folks at the Ecky Ranch, God, they've been doing this for like 30 years here at the Tonight Show. These are their beautiful poinsettias, so we thank them. There's a bibliography at the end of Myth and Legend, but no in-text citations are used except for quotes and statistics. That's practically the story of my life at this point. So trying to trace individual claims has been frustrating to say the least. Having said that, there is one citation that I think is critical to unraveling everything. I've been sidestepping something for a while now. 
I've gone this whole video without reading aloud the single sentence on Wikipedia that set me down this rabbit hole. There's our legend about Pepita, the one we know and love, and a few sentences later, poinsettias are popular Christmas decorations as a result of the extensive marketing campaign by the Eki family. The Eki family. So here's the real story of the modern poinsettia. Albert Eki moved from Germany to the United States in 1902, often erroneously reported as 1900, and opened a farm in California. Within a few years, he'd taken an interest in poinsettias and started growing and selling them ornamentally on a small scale. This was the genesis of four generations of Eckies maintaining a nearly hundred year monopoly on the poinsettia market. It was Albert's son, Paul Eki Sr., who cultivated the poinsettia extensively and produced a new version, one much smaller and more picturesque than the wild shrubs they used to be. You ever notice that nobody grows their own poinsettias? That's because the entire growth is controlled. It undergoes an extensive process of treatments that ensure that it grows into the idyllic symbol the consumer expects. In fact, for decades the method of breeding and growing these elegant poinsettias was a trade secret. Such a secret that at one point it was supposedly known to only three people. It didn't take long at all for the Eki farm to relocate and upsize, eschewing all produce but poinsettia. The third poinsettia patriarch, Paul Eki Jr., took over the company in the 50s and began marketing the plant with gusto, pushing in particular the Christmas angle and encouraging its status as the Christmas flower. To be clear, there is evidence of Christmas associations before the 50s. Not Franciscan friars, mind you, but Noche Buena is attested from at least 1923. There was a good housekeeping article on how to throw a poinsettia party in 1920, and an even earlier article suggesting a poinsettia party from 1910. It's worth noting that while the 1920 article, which is by someone only credited as Elaine, specifically calls it a poinsettia party for the holiday season, the 1910 piece by Charlotte Brewster Jordan in the Ladies Home Journal suggests it for a birthday that falls near Christmas. A major part of the Eki marketing was sending poinsettias to talk shows and even making appearances on them. Pictured is a screen grab of Paul Eki Jr. on the Dinah Shore show. Women's magazines were another target. Paul Jr. apparently phoned multiple magazines to try and convince them that poinsettias were the future of Christmas iconography. They even grew plants out of season so that they could be used for marketing photo shoots in the summer. A seminal 2008 LA Times article by Mike Anton, the article from which most of this Eki history lesson derives, says, the Eki's are to poinsettias what De Beers is to diamonds. Is that what you want to be? The ranch was run with a famously high standard of quality which lent even more prestige to poinsettias and the Eki name. The empire went unchallenged until the 90s under the reign of Paul Eki III when two researchers deduced and publicized the secret behind Eki style poinsettias. This is something that the Ekis have described as ruining them. What happened next should be obvious. The market was cracked open like an egg. According to Anton, as of 2008, Eki still had 70% of the domestic market share on poinsettias and 50% worldwide, which, while still a visible decrease from the peak domestic share of 90%, is still frankly colossal, but the massive influx of competition drove prices to the ground. It reached the point where big retailers started selling poinsettias as loss leaders. Maybe there's something sad about that, but like, I just don't know how to sympathize with the collapse of a monopoly. Breeding variants of different colors and shapes is now the name of the game. Cultivars are patented, but the patents are apparently frequently skirted through some kind of botanical cloning that's beyond me. In response to the losses, major cost-cutting measures were undertaken. The California ranch was pared back to be just headquarters and R&D, while the majority of growing was outsourced to Guatemala. In 2012, Eki was bought by a Dutch conglomerate called the Agribio Group, which one year later merged with a German company called Dummen. The name Eki is still used as a subsidiary. The main maintenance of the goodwill of the brand reputation was of significance during the sale. But even though no members of the family remain in the business, they've definitely made their mark. In Encinitas, California, there's an elementary school named after them. Poinsettia Day was officially declared in honor of Paul Eki Jr. after his death. You can see the congressional statement on it and everything. They talk about him like a hero. It's so funny that this whole statement is about how great Paul Eki is, but Poinsettia Day is Joel Poinsett's death date of all things. You know it's only because he died in December. There's a photo of Paul Jr. 
with President Gerald Ford. That's like the third US president I've been forced to name drop in this video. I shouldn't even know these names. I've used the rhetoric more than once, but the Eckies were royalty in the business. The Eckie Ranch was a family business with effectively final say over the market. They would pressure retailers in terms of pricing. In fact, they're well documented throwing their weight around. They exerted pressure on the local city council and had closed meetings with them. It's even been claimed that their sway has influenced political outcomes. It is documented that the Eckies, through pressuring municipal councils, affected the positioning of at least two highways in California, including an interstate. They built a whole case about how one of those highways would cut through their poinsettia fields and potentially even harm the crops, which I guess is more important than transport infrastructure for the rest of the world. In 1994, the city of Encinitas annexed a portion of Eki land with a $400 million payoff. All this while they were paying pithy taxes. The mythologizing of this royal family isn't really extended to the hundreds of employees in both the United States and Guatemala who actually grew the poinsettias. It's hard to get a handle on the worker situation at Eki Ranch. In the 70s, it was reported that there were between 100 and 200 employees. In 2004, it was claimed that there were 300 in the States and 800 in Guatemala. No source on that, so big grain of salt. Supposedly, there were 88 employees at the time of purchase in 2012, most of them in Guatemala. The difference between these last two estimates is so staggering that I have to wonder if one of them like misplaced a digit or is otherwise mistaken. As far as I can tell, a lot of Eki employees seem to have genuinely enjoyed working there. The American ones, anyway. I haven't been able to find any statements from the Guatemalan employees. Paul Eki Jr. in particular apparently had a strong rapport with the workers and was largely respected. So maybe they're not that bad after all. Well, the philanthropy thing and the friendly boss thing just don't really do anything for me. The virtuous exception doesn't fix anything. Like a situation where the king can execute anybody whenever he wants, but see, he's a good guy, so you don't need to worry about it. That's just not good enough for me. But well, this video is not intended to be a call out post for a corporation. That's kind of a redundancy anyway. If that's what I was after, I could take several angles. The use of hundreds of acres of land for mass growing ornamental plants, going international as a cost cutting measure being an expression of modern imperialism, or any of the things I just described. I think some people who watch this video are gonna assume that all this is me arguing for why you shouldn't buy or display poinsettias and you shouldn't use them for Christmas or whatever. I truly don't care about that. I bought a poinsettia to display in this video. It was $10 at a corner store, which by the way is a ripoff. I kind of walked into it though by buying a poinsettia in mid-December. This video is not about morality through consumerism. What this video is about is the truth about poinsettia. The toppling of the Poinsettia Empire has left a void. Going about this investigation while the Eki Ranch itself is a relic, it's like getting to the second story without a staircase. You might have guessed where I'm going with this. The business model isn't actually about growing and selling poinsettias directly. Eki only ever directly supplied flowers to independent florists. The real money is in selling cuttings to other growers who use them to grow more poinsettias and then sell those to retailers. But growing poinsettias, especially especially picture-perfect ones, is an extremely involved process. And that's why they published the Eki Poinsettia Manual. Four editions in 1971, 1976, 1990, and 2004. It's the most comprehensive bible there is to the art of poinsettia culturing, and it's inaccessible. Extensive research and teeth grinding have determined that there are no copies in my city. Not in the bookstores, not in the libraries. The only options I'm left with are to either buy a copy online for $500, which is completely out of the question, or to take a three-hour bus ride to a university library with a copy of the 2004 edition, which I would genuinely consider if there was any chance they would let a non-student access it. There's no ebook available either. It's listed on Google Books, and you can search the body and get cropped passages, which indicates that it's been at least partially scanned, but it is literally impossible to view the full pages. You can't 
can't even pay to access it. You can just search terms and get snippets. Remember the game Her Story? That became my reality. Fortunately, the majority of this book is about the agricultural stuff, and we don't really care about that. The history of poinsettias is relegated to a small section in the first few pages. Guess what's in that section? Montezuma, Franciscan priests, Santa Pesebre, Hernando Ruiz, Poinsett the Botanist, South Carolina, Juan Balm. It would be easier to tell you what claims aren't in this book. The process of naming is not covered at all. No mention of Vildeneau or Prescott. There's also nothing on the Pepita legend, and I tried a few search terms. For the record, no search term pertaining to a works cited list turns anything up either. You probably could have seen that one coming. Juan Balm is once again the really interesting part. The 1976 and 1990 versions both include several sentences about Balm, but the 2004 version pairs it back to the barest mention. Searching the keywords from the 1990 snippets in the 2004 version turns up nothing. The two captures for Balm from the 1990 version have something missing between them, so on a whim I googled a portion of the quote and I stumbled back upon one of the poinsettia articles I had previously witnessed. A piece from 2017 by Terry Schaff. It turns out that a whole chunk of this article is lifted right out of the poinsettia manual. There are a couple of tiny changes, most notably Nat Activity becoming native, but for the most part it's word for word, which is hilarious for the record, but also useful. It allows us to actually look at the history section of the Poinsettia Manual. Uh, maybe this isn't the cultural moment to say this, but this is an instance where the fact that somebody plagiarized is an unambiguously helpful thing. So here's the full quote. Juan Balm, a botanist of the same period, mentioned the Poinsettia plant in his writings. He described it as having large green leaves- hang on a second. The history and diseases of poinsettia also copied the exact same words from the poinsettia manual. Who even wrote that paper anyway? Seriously? I guess you don't need to give credit when you work for the company that spat out the book you're copying. The fact that the 2004 edition removed most of the details of the Juan Balm story is kind of suspect. Maybe it was considered padded, maybe someone realized there was no basis for it, maybe a lot of the contributions from the 1990 edition were just gutted. To really get some insight on that, I need to have at least three editions of this book sitting in front of me, so all the cards are on the table. I've laid out everything that we need to illustrate the history of the myths of the poinsettia and how they came to compose the sheer body of the poinsettia's so-called history as accurately as we can. The Pepita story, or rather the story of an unnamed child, has, as we know, been circulating since at least the 60s. The Eki manual in the 70s appears to be the root of several claims. That Montezuma imported poinsettias, that Juan Balm wrote about poinsettias, that Franciscan monks grew poinsettias for Santa Pesebra that Hernando Ruiz observed this, and that expert botanist Poinsett delightfully stumbled on the plant before having it sent to South Carolina. Each of these myths was propagated by subsequent sources using the Eki manual as a reference. Bersiaga's essay in 1992 pioneered two claims. First, the one about Poinsettismo, which was repeated in a Washington Post article and several others since, and second, the interpretation of Quetlaxochitl as mortal flower that perishes and withers like all that is pure, which also found its way into the news afterward. The last major stop is Myth and Legend, the 1997 book by Anderson and Tischer that we tore apart a few minutes ago. In addition to repeating several claims from the Eki Poinsettia Manual, that's the notable citation I alluded to before if it wasn't obvious, Myth and Legend elaborated on the stories about Poinsett, seemingly created the myths about Vildeneau and Prescott, and pinned the name Pepita to the character in the legend. And what do we see in the following few years? We see the Eki Ranch website, the Hoover Museum Poinsettia webpage and the history and diseases of Poinsettia, each of which borrows and repeats claims from either the Poinsettia Manual, Myth and Legend, or one another. And downstream of that, it's just a million repetitions in a million articles. For the record, I was not looking for this, but in the Eki archives, which are a thing by the way, there's an image of a project Paul Eki Jr. did in elementary school called Franciscan Missions of California. That proves that he is 
aware of Franciscans. It's a fucking conspiracy. But jokes aside, we now have our vector. The information from the Poinsettia Manual was separately repackaged in Myth and Legend, History and Diseases, and Eki's own website. And every subsequent source appears to have derived its information from one of these four. For whatever it's worth, the Pepita story seems to have spread separately. I comprehensively looked through each of the citations in Myth and Legend which had anything to do with Christmas or poinsettias. A couple of them mention this legend or variants of it, but none of them use the name Pepita, so it appears as though Myth and Legend is the genesis of that name. The claims about Vildeno seeing the plant grow through a crack and William Prescott naming the poinsettia also seem to originate in the Myth and Legend book, although if anyone finds earlier attestations, I will defer. The Eckies may not have touched these claims, but they certainly benefited from them. Every storybook about the legend of the poinsettia is free advertising. And that's really what it comes to. Anton quotes Ruth Kobayashi, a breeder at Eki Ranch, as saying, people don't treat poinsettias like they're special anymore, but they are special. I have no reason to doubt that this is a sincerely held belief. Frankly, it's not my place to call into question the authenticity of somebody's stated opinion, but one way or another, this is the Eki narrative. Paul Eki Jr.'s marketing skills are famous. Anton even compares him to P.T. Barnum for the way he pushed his cell. Poinsettias are supposed to be emotional. They're supposed to be traditional and sentimental, a necessary companion to all the feelings one associates with Christmas. And they are that way because that sells. While I was reviewing the works cited from Myth and Legend, one of the books I came across was The Great American Christmas Almanac from 1988. It has a few of the factoids we've seen elsewhere, but I was struck by the turns of phrase. The New World's Contribution to Christmas. Eki is an American success story. That's Kind of saying the quiet part out loud, isn't it? The stories of the poinsettia and of the Ekis play into the cultural images not only of the capitalist go-getter who achieves the American dream, which is pretty funny by the way if you know that Albert Ecky owned a business before he even came to America, but of rugged dominance over the land and the wilderness, and particularly an American dominance over a Mexican wilderness. An American capitalist being the one to take hold of this Mexican plant and assign meaning, beauty, and value to it. Here's another quote, this one from the 40s. Paul Ecke took the wild, unpredictable immigrant from Mexico and made it into a tame beauty. The part that really kills me is how the narratives run up against each other. There's a cross-up when you try to take everything into account. Pepito was a Christmas legend since the 1500s. Monks made poinsettia as a Christmas thing in the 1600s, possibly because of Pepita. Poinsett saw poinsettias in exactly that context, but it was Ecke who said this would make a great Christmas decoration. Like the volume of sources that say, yeah, there's this ancient legend demonstrating that poinsettias have been associated with Christmas for centuries, but poinsettias weren't really associated with Christmas until Paul Ecke. Which is it? Is this a long-standing Christmas tradition, a 500-year-old phenomenon that consumers are being tied into, or is it an ingenious bit of capitalism by a 20th century American hero? And contradictions are kind of at the heart of the poinsettia. It's a flower that tries to package a few feeling an image of quaint, delicate authenticity of specialness, uniquity, and holiness. And it's also a flower that's farm grown by the millions. Millions of that unique, special, quaint image produced side by side every year. To me, it just rings like the fireplace channel, a hollow facsimile of some pastoral sentimentality. It's a mass-produced Christmas miracle. Sorry if I'm killing the magic, but for what it's worth, Santa's not real either. And this is something you have to keep in mind when remembering the myths propagated by the Ekkies. The myths of a centuries-old Christmas tradition crucially furthered by a so-called American hero, one who has to be construed as a hero to make his contribution to this story actually matter. The most cynical interpretation is that the Ekkies deliberately fabricated all of these facts to further a narrative. The most generous interpretation is that it was a string of honest mistakes or misunderstandings of facts or repetition of myths heard elsewhere and that it all just managed to go unchecked for four editions. The same kind of banality that transforms nativity into native. But it doesn't really matter how intentional it was or wasn't. The fact is, 
The misinformation works in Eki's favor. The information showing that Joel Poinsett can't be proven to have brought the Poinsettia to the United States is publicly available. The question isn't whether the Eki's knew that or not, it doesn't matter. The question is if the Eki's did know, would they be incentivized to be truthful about it, or would they be incentivized to forget about it? And the counterpart to the earlier question of whether these lies are genuinely harmful is the question of whether they were actually necessary. Could the Poinsettia have been sold on its own merit without appeals to a non-existent long-standing tradition. It probably could have, but the extra push doesn't hurt. The fact is, the story was part of the pitch. When there are two narratives you can use, and one of them is this is a five-century-old Christmas tradition brought to us by a major historical figure, and the other one is this is a flower from Mexico that spread to America at some point and we want to sell it to you as a Christmas decoration, one of these is a better sell. There is a financial incentive and a cultural one for pedal and embellished history. It's not even about whether they were knowingly pushing lies or what, it's the fact that the truth isn't even on the radar because it doesn't need to be. When you are the Poinsettia Empire, the facts about Poinsettias come from you. It doesn't matter if you lie or if you make mistakes, because your lies become the truth, your mistakes become the truth. And really, when has marketing ever been about truth? Cigarettes are healthy, and those really are x-ray glasses, and that bag of chips isn't two-thirds air. The hours of labor from hundreds of workers that brought that poinsettia to you are phantasmal. Keep in mind that the work was taken to Guatemala to cut costs. Consider what that implies about how much those employees were being paid. But the big lie, the lie that surrounds all the others, tells us that whether domestic or overseas, those workers might as well be elves in Santa's workshop, because the poinsettia is a miracle, a gift from God. And if any human hands have touched the poinsettia, they're the hands of a small and elite selection. Because the quote-unquote real story of the poinsettia is one that's run by by great men, kings, politicians, and landowners. You have Joel Poinsett and Paul Ecke Jr. to thank for the internationalization of the poinsettia, but the people actually growing it barely even merit a footnote. Owning slaves is fine, and furthering American interests in other countries is fine, so long as you can get your name attached to a popular flower. But what would Joel Poinsett have had, what would he have been capable of, if he didn't legally own human beings who were forced to work for him? What would the Eckies have been capable of, without people to actually do the work. All the trade secrets in the world can't help you if there's nobody to grow your plants for you. The big lie is that poinsettias are important, that poinsettias are necessary. It's the kind of lie that creates consumerism through tradition. That makes the comparison of the Eckies to De Beers make sense. In the same way that De Beers created the necessity of the wedding ring, the Eckies created the necessity of the poinsettia, the synonymy of the poinsettia with Christmas. Making a product an absolute necessity for Christmas is one of the most lucrative things you can pull off, especially when you can keep the production of that product a trade secret. The origin of the association of the poinsettia with Christmas is extremely tenuous, but the fact remains, this plant turns red and green toward winter. I'm sure any number of people could independently have made a comparison to Christmas, but the Eki Ranch is absolutely the one to blame for the fact that it's now THE Christmas flower. Whether there even should be a Christmas flower is another question entirely. You can say that this gaggle of little falsehoods which have found their way into academic papers and university websites is ultimately meaningless, but I think there's a broader implication here. This isn't ultimately just a story of a single monopoly forever tinting the history of its industry, and it's not even just a story of an ocean of vacuous articles endlessly recycling the same facts without checking. It's a story of the modern creation of a tradition that appeals to a fictionalized history for profit. It's a story of capitalism stymieing our ability to find or produce meaning in something for ourselves because that meaning is instead being served to us on a platter. And it's a story of a monopolistic corporate authority handed the power to rewrite the roadmap of the world, at times the literal roadmap. That kind of nested power that exists only to generate capital, I don't think it should exist. I've never been shy about the interest I take in the origin and spread of misinformation. I have a whole playlist on the subject. The fact is that capitalism is an enemy of a lot of things, and factuality is one of them. Advertising is by nature persuasive, and I know that you know how bad ads have been recently. Misinformation is encouraged under this economic incentive structure. Necessity is manufactured left and right, and new rituals are produced in pursuit suit of that. Christmas is a festival of capitalism and consumerism. Every facet of the holiday boils down to money. Why would the poinsettia be any different?
Thanks for watching. You can check out my Tumblr at Indigo's Findings. As a small update, I've been working in earnest on a major video project for a long while now. I put that project on hold for a couple weeks to make this video, but I'm probably not going to be uploading for a few months after this. Anyway, hope you liked the video. See ya! Okay, if you're still here, I have one more thing to get off my chest. Mortal flower that perishes and withers like all that is pure. Like, what the fuck is that? You're saying all pure things wither and perish? And what, impure things don't? What does this mean? This is why I called it fake deep. It's not like saying anything. Perishes and withers like all that is pure. Is like living the prerogative of the impure? Is this about GMOs? Is this about, like, preservatives? What does it mean? <laughs> I'm so upset. What the fuck does this mean? <laughs>